Welcome back to the ThinkTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. This is our 179th show. We're doing this on a very special day, which is getting a new uh, political and cultural leadership in our United States of America. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And we're doing this embodied by the 49th uh, vice president, uh, Camilla Harris, who is the first woman of uh, multiple colors, as they said. And that's awesome enough. And it's going to be the 46th uh, president, Joseph Biden, together with her. And we can't wait. And he gave already, he twittered out uh, much better things than the previous guy, not that we we'll remember that. And he basically said, there is no time to waste, so let's go rushing. But he also tweeted another thing that basically was, um, well, first of all, he was, uh, this gets us to the, the bottom right, I have to say, um, two weeks ago when there was uh, the electoral college, college vote, uh, we were very worried about the riots, which then actually happened. We can uh, safely say that today was all safe ceremonies, and that's thanks to a representative for all the other ones uh, basically protecting us is your grand nephew up there at the very top, Ron, uh, who is uh, part of the National Guard and, and protecting us. And so uh, needless to say, I almost forgot we're broadcasting live again from three different countries and climates uh, uh, representing three different cultures. Uh, I'm in Germany, uh, you, Ron, are in Long Beach, California, and you, DeSoto, are back in Honolulu, Hawaii. And so, you know, it seems we must have sensed because when uh, Biden, at the beginning of his speech, was basically um, thanking all his predecessors in attendance, he didn't mention them by name. The one that he mentioned, uh, and he said he called him last night, and he wanted to salute to his lifetime achievements. Guess who that is? Well, I know because his picture is up there. It is Jimmy Carter, former president, um, who was renowned for, at least for our, for some of us, as uh, an innovator in uh, technology, an innovator, a supporter of scientific knowledge, and uh, really an all-around good guy. And so, that's, yeah. uh, that's, that's good that he was acknowledged. And that seems like we're coming full circle and Joel really wants to pick up where, where Jimmy had left. And he said, he Twittered something else really. Uh, and it is great to have Twitters that encourage you, right? Yeah. No. Uh, he said, this is time for testing. And that gets us to the, the, the prime time of America, mid-century where it was all about testing and in our field of architecture, what better way of basically testing prototyping is case studying, right? And that gets us back to your kind Christmas gift, Ron, that we see at the very bottom right. But I have to say that the gift also gave us a couple of the, the, the goodies of, of, your, of your office's work, uh, of Ed's pioneering work, but also uh, featured other case study architect work. And in fact, uh, one of them basically made it on the title page um, of the book. And let's go to the second slide and you tell us, Ron, who that was. Yes, uh, it was an architect named Craig Elwood in California, who his office created again, some of the most elegant homes of Southern California mid-century modernism. And at the same time, he was given the opportunity by John and Tenza to design three case study houses in a row, 16, 17, and 18, all in Los Angeles. On the cover of the book is uh, case house number 17, which was actually built in, in Beverly Hills. Now, critics called him the California Mies van der Rohe because that most of the famous buildings of his houses at least, were steel framed, very pristine, minimalist pavilions. In fact, he was the only one of the younger generation modernists whom Mies van der Rohe took seriously. And he often spoke highly of, of Elwood as a disciple. Uh, in the center, a larger photograph is a home called the Rosen House, which in my mind is one of the most nearly Miesian homes that he built. Now, when we talk about architects, we often don't get too much about 
They're interesting personalities. And there's no architect probably with a more interesting personal history than Craig Elwood. Because even though he got this kind words from Mies van der Rohe, there's no question that he was an outsider as far as the architectural profession was concerned. Uh, he completely bypassed university. He had no architectural training. He did work for a contractor for a while doing cost estimating and job supervision. And interestingly enough, he did that on several case study houses before he did his own. Those were done by Raphael Soriano. Uh, and he, he just had no formal education. Not only that, he had no apprenticeship you know, with, with an architect to sort of, uh, as a mentor or to lead him. Uh, the genius Frank Lloyd Wright, of course, is famous for having no college education, but he had a long involved and deep mentorship with Louis Sullivan in Chicago. I, here's where we get into the personality. <laughs> this gentleman could not draw. He certainly was not an architect, but what he was, was an incredible showman and he could market himself and his office, which produced wonderful buildings, very, very beautiful mid-century modern buildings. Uh, he came to, Calif uh, to California from Texas as Johnny Burke. And he felt that just wasn't, he needed a new life in the Golden State. So there was a, a liquor store in his neighborhood near Beverly Hills called Elwood's. So he took his last name as Elwood. He took Craig because it sounded cool. It sounded like that's a name that a, an astronaut would have. <laughs> but he was such a personality. He married uh, a very uh, popular television entertainer. Uh, DeSoto might remember this. She played the mother on a long lasting series called Dennis the Menace. Oh yes. <laughs> and in fact, he and his wife became sort of an it couple in Beverly Hills. But uh, in fact, he was called the Cary Grant of architecture on the West Coast. Very handsome gentleman, very gregarious and he could sell ice to the Eskimos. But his work day was really interesting. He would arrive in his Lamborghini or his Ferrari at his own office that he had designed about mid-afternoon. Then he'd sit with his designers in his office and talk for a while. And he would give his opinions, his perspective. And he did have a terrific uh, talent in detailing, especially structural detailing, which on steel, steel buildings is so important. But then he'd lunch in Beverly Hills. He'd come back, leave in the mid-afternoon in his tennis whites, either to play tennis or to walk his pet big cat, which, which looked like a panther to me, uh, through Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. This guy did not give any credit to the people that worked for him. Uh, he had no partners. But what, what he did do is that he did give direct responsibility to his designers for initiating the initial design concepts of everything. And we have to give him incredible credit for by himself creating an office that produced such fine architecture, such as this very Miesian Rosenhaus that we're seeing in that middle picture on the slide. And I'm not sure, uh, Martin, if you had some comments about the yeah. pictures in the bottom. Well, we, we probably at the top, we, we, we say he sort of was pushed out of his office and then basically went to Italy, became a painter and, and died in a not too old age. And giving credits, uh, you know, to, to his staff, uh, there is Mr. Lomax up here who is credited to be the, the designer. And I always think, you know, this is for Eric, Eric Bricker who doing, who's doing the Killingsworth movie. Couldn't be any more different to see the personalities of, uh, of Craig Elwood, Elias, Johnny Burke, and Edward Killingsworth. Right? They couldn't be more yin and yang uh, to the point that um, Ed was more than recognizing the very best in his office to a point that he made his best people his partner. You being the living example of that. So I, I think that pretty much um, Elwood, again, did it, as you said, only in America or only in California, one could say, right?
But uh, in all fairness, Mies van der Rohe also didn't study architecture. He was sort of a self-trained, so maybe he alluded to that of his master. But at the bottom, it's that we pointed out in our courtyard show that Mies actually was doing courtyards uh, always with his students, but never in his practice. He left it up to his disciples, as we were pointing out to that one project in Chicago. Getting to the next slide, which shows the Rosenhaus that you, Ron, choose as what's most representative uh, best practices for, for Craig Elwood's uh, firm. And here we're pointing out to something else that is different for his, interesting for historians to do our quick uh, biochromatic check, because by the way, uh, the Biden administration is going to return to the uh, Paris Climate Agreement, yeah. So environmentalism is back. And, and Mies van der Rohe, until his very end, wasn't really known for that. When he finally worked on the Bacardi project in the other tropics and fi finally in its last masterpiece in Germany, the National Gallery, he was actually pushing the glass back uh, and, and having you know, glass be shaded. But that was relatively parallel to when, when, when the Elwood office was doing this here. And so not only do we have the central courtyard as something to keep the building cool, but we also have um, the glass facade pushed back to the north where it's framing the kind of the, uh, the, the entry. And then to the south, more importantly, it's pushed back and there the whole glass facade gets shaded. So we can say, you know, um, the Elwood office was sort of environmentalizing the, 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 Miesian, the Miesian idea, and, and that's, that's really rather interesting. Let's go to the next slide, um, because this is again, thank you, your gift, Ron. And, and so this case study house uh, that made it to the title page has this really weird thing that there's this really typical, pretty closed and opaque austere facade, but then there is something sticking out of it. And when you look closer in the plan, you would think this is a really important part of the program. It actually might be, but in what we like, a proletarian way, because this is like the maid's quarter with, a, with, a, with an own courtyard that he's kind of celebrating and sticking out of that. But uh, again, um, even though you know we, we think now is a new era and it should be, but we still have to deal with things from the past so here, for example, that project was hit by uh, the early uh, upcoming of reactionary in the Ronnie Reagan talking California and showman era, because this, as we read in the book, uh, the house basically is not recognizable as what it is because it had been turned into a pseudo classical mansion. And that reminds us of the continuous talk of cynical classicism versus cultivated classicism. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, this is reminding me back of my prairie days here. This is in, in Omaha, Nebraska, where uh, my dear mentor, Bill, who I had just lost, uh, basically took me out to these uh, big corporate firms. This one here is Leo A. Daly. And our um, great emerging talent met the boar at the top right amongst his many talents is that he was a gifted, is, still is a gifted photographer was allowed to go in and there's this pavilion of Mr. Daly the first. It's this private little getaway and it's full of Picassos and Giacometti's that we get to later <laughs> down in the show. So interesting. And the next project, uh, next slide is what uh, Matt moved on to, which is HDR, which is an even larger in revenue ranking firm headquartered in the, in the heartland in the Midwest. And this is a very proud sort of a naive and, and innocent because that was just before uh, the big rain check of the first oil crisis. But until then, one was innocent about fossil fuel and representative for that, uh, our methodologies of vehicles as, uh, of, of automobiles as, as vehicles for thought. There's my 72 Plymouth Fury that I proudly owned during my student days because I wanted to live up the Americana. So here they both are. If you take these two projects together, uh, you get something that we are very familiar and is one of our favorites. And that gets us to the next slide. And you tell us, DeSoto, what that is. Well, here's the Ala Moana building here in Honolulu, built in 1961. And it originally had a series of vertical louvers on the exterior, which moved according to the position of the sun during the day. And unfortunately, they have been removed from the building as they deteriorated. 
But this is what we're seeing here is pictures of a similar system on that building that you were discussing, except unlike the Alamana building, they did not move automatically. This was actually cranked by a person who would change their positions during the day according to where the sun was. Yeah, and in this, this is Leo Daily headquarters, the original one from the heydays. It still has these aluminum louvers and they're cranked manually by the caretaker of the building. So again, bring the louvers back to our uh, Alamoana building as again, to recognize the, uh, the, the tradition of innovation on the island as one of my favorite presentations of yours to Soto. And let's go to the next slide. Um, you guys recall this sort of memory of mine, please. <laughs> well, this was this is a, possibly the most famous case study house. This is case study house number 22. And you visited Hollywood to, among other things, look at architecture. You took the picture at the bottom of the screen of the house seen from below. And while you were doing so, a woman who lived in that neighborhood stopped and asked you what you were doing because she had no idea that this house that she paid no attention to was such an iconic and important piece of architecture. So she was living there heedless of it and not caring what it represented because it's such a representative of the time period in which it was made of the 1959, 1960. Yeah. So hopefully now with a new era starting now, we have more recognition and realization of the best we have. And again, pick up from where that has left and basically evolve that, which gets us to the next slide, which is we stole this from basically uh, the longest in the making show uh, about skins, uh, our first, second and third skins and their relationship. We call it the working title is address code, address code. And here is uh, the just past President Trump retracting back to his, I think Ron, you last time when you were like summarizing the styles he was mandating, Mediterranean, I think was part of that. And you said that's sort of what the, uh, the, the Marjorie Post who had built it originally was sort of modeling it after way back. And he's going back to that and he's kind of overdressed for that while our more appropriately dressed for where he comes from in parts uh, President Barack Obama is going back to Honolulu, uh, excuse me, to uh, Tuahu in a little bit that we've been reporting on. But let's go to the next slide in basically saying, um, you know, that's what he's facing at the bottom is two cars flipped on the side in front of his gate of his new house. And while we are pretty sure, you know, the architects he has chosen for his new house, they will be pretty decent. They will not be too McMansion-y. It will be architecturally pretty much okay, but will it be, which I think what Joe is talking about, what it has to be, which Ed tried as part of the case study houses up there, a building also on an ocean front, so maybe questionable as far as its, its location, but technologically really an innovator because it wanted to do these styrofoam concrete panels that, you know, didn't happen, unfortunately, as you told us, Ron, but, but should have happened, right? So next slide. Um, so the last picture was just, you know, putting it in our face. Uh, one of the three main challenges we're facing. One is, of course, rising number of the COVID crisis, uh, first and foremost, but then the climate crisis and certainly a civility crisis represented through social inequity. So how can we make shelter? And that's the core of our profession and discipline for the many in need and certainly not through single family housing that's just sprawling, you know, and to that degree, again, please past presidents and future presidents think of that. And once again, Joe's now publicly announced big idol is uh, Jimmy is the only one who had lived in social housing and knows. And that's why he's still out there and about for, um, you know, uh, humanities and, and building houses like that. So in fact, going back to your Christmas gift for us, Ron, Ed once again was the closest to tackle the housing crisis, which was not single family, but actually multi-dwelling. So tell us what we see here. Yeah, Ed was the only case study house architect who actually involved community planning and trying to have uh, multi-family unit housing uh, where people would feel uh, neighborly to each other. And that actually could be something brought out through architecture and planning. 
And so we're just looking at several pages inside the small format Toshin book on case study houses of the 10 units, which unfortunately were, were unbuilt back in 1964 in Newport Beach, California. Yeah, and while you guys successfully and rightly so and thankfully basically became the masters in resort architecture, so we're retracting back from that typology, but there were actually two cases, uh, two examples that we've been talking before that were basically um, basically optimizing that case studying. That gets us to the next page and let's recall who these are. And one is actually very small in there, but it's actually what we see behind you because it's your house, Ron, that not your office itself, but a developer as we've been reporting on had been inspired by Ed's work and, and done houses that you now happily reside in one that's very much in the spirit of that one. And which is the other project that's built that's very close to us and we're always worried about it that is exemplifying the best of tropical multi-dwelling. You see it at the top right. Yeah, uh, really one of the most successful uh, condominium developments uh, way back in, in 1967 was the Kahala Beach Apartments. And there, there were 196 units developed uh, and quite a sense of community there. And we're all worried about that uh, wonderful piece of planning and architecture because there might come that time when the owners of the land that have the lease of the land underneath it might consider replacing it with God knows what. Absolutely. And again, I just wanna go back to, again, a kind of comparison between different architectural practices. What I always find most amazing about your guys' work is that you were like uncorruptible, uncorruptible true to yourself and to your mission of exquisite modernism uh, in increasingly working in the tropics uh, in, in the best, uh, you know, ex tropical, exotic, easy breezy way. And you were doing these through these kind of really tempting times of, as you've been talking about, we reference at the bottom right of postmodernism, where, you know, people like Philip Johnson and many more got seduced. And, and your Holly Kalani is the best example why, and your proof that we, uh, you basically carry the, uh, the medal that we gave to you of the best postmodern architect because it's postmodern. Uh, in the most human, humane way. And you carried that through all the way to even the early 90s, which is that desperate time I had to go to school where we're pretty much lost, but you guys weren't. As you see us here standing, you, seeing you standing in front of uh, your friend and partner, Larry Stricker, is Ihilani from the early 90s. And at the point where you just thought, okay, now it's time to enjoy ourselves and, you know, retiring, rightly so, he just called it good. So there's like half of a century of just staying true to your guys and to yourself. And uh, we, along the discussion of, you know, uh, you guys, again, being great role models for us and to rather than reinvent the wheel, being aware of how well the wheel was running, uh, we had another gentleman came to our mind recently that's along the same lines. And let's go to the next slide and you, Ron, share with us who that is. Yeah, there, there's uh, an architect I've admired for a long time who created a, a, uh, an architectural office ver with very early emphasis on environmental design. It was called Site. And the architect was James Wines. And the main focus of the design really were green issues and integrating buildings with their surrounding context. Uh, and I think I reminded you, Martin, that in Germany right now, if, if it were available, unfortunately the pandemic has the museum closed, but the world's only museum that only has architectural drawings, which is called the Choban Museum in Berlin, right now has the current retrospective from 1970 to 2000 of James Wine's work, uh, wonderful work. Absolutely, and we threw in here the Giacometti because in uh, one of the recent interviews of James Wine, he got a little upset because he felt like he was cornered in by, you know, his architecture is about ruins. And he basically said it would be like if you say 
Giacometti's, um, you know, sculptures were about starving people. And of course, <laughs> there it's not. And so it's the same as if you would, you know, not want to be reduced to classicism. Of course, these are principles you guys have been obeying to. But then there's a whole cosmos, there's a whole world of humanity and humility that we're all now so eager to get back to that's that's behind all that one. And the next slide, and we got to make it fast because it's the end of the show. But here is one of James's projects here from, again, uh, when Jimmy was phasing out and right before uh, the, the surface cowboy, Ronnie came on the stage here, he was making this manifesto of the high rises of homes. And the next slide, uh, once again, uh, as he was addressing diversity, um, basically in density, these are things that are very familiar to us these days that we're researching on. And again, here is the poster of the show going on that in my country here that you, Ron, have pointed out on behalf of James. And next slide is uh, pretty much, once again, um, nature as revenge is one of the provocative slogans as another one was attacking architecture. And he means the conventions of architecture. I think that is what, what our new president means. It's time for testing. This is what the primitivas want to do and they want to jump the fence. Just like, you know, Joe's big hero, Jimmy here, who was literally jumping fences because he was fit enough, just <laughs> overcome these stereotypes, these things that you take for granted and move on to stuff that you think you, you really need. And last slide here is us um, basically reporting that Primitiva 3 is in development. We're gonna meet uh, tomorrow again with a team. And we're gonna have Larry Medlin with us who we did a show that we call Einstein, Einstein's Architects because he had gotten to know and he was best friends with Conrad Waxman and with Fry Otto, who's a mentor of, of this project here. But I remember when Larry told me that when uh, Reagan took office, um, basically the day after that, he got pulled his funds for his environmental studies. And so things coming full circle. And again, uh, Joe having officially said, who uh, inspires him, Jimmy, this you know, makes up for that and let's go to full circle and, and reconnect to these glorious, heroic, pioneering American days that we're all so fond of. Uh, here being in our different cultures and climates. So uh, it was fun once again. Um, see you guys soon again. And until then, obviously, most importantly, stay healthy and increasingly happy.